So, Reg, where were you when you heard about Gagarin's flight into space? Uh, well, I, I was in London. Uh, in fact, I was doing some interviews uh, because the Americans were planning to close down some of their bases in Britain. Oh. I was doing stories about that. And, of course, you went off to Moscow for the very first space conference, two days after the flight itself. What are your recollections of the Moscow press conference? Well, it was the most phony press conference I've ever attended. And um, although I put the best gloss on it possible at the time, um, it was a really unpleasant experience uh, because um, they gave me a visa in London quickly enough to go to Moscow. And you must remember the Cold War was at its height, mm. the really unpleasant atmosphere between the West and the Soviet Union. We called them the Soviets those days, uh -huh. not the Russians. And when I got there, uh, I had to queue up half the night or uh, trying to get a ticket for, to get into the press conference. Uh -huh. And when I arrived there, it was the Academy of Sciences Hall in Moscow. Um, my ticket was waved aside as if it was not important and it didn't, they said no, it not, doesn't count and so on. And with a number of other foreign journalists, I was kept outside and we, we could sort of see into the hall through the door, which was barred to us. The front of the hall <coughs> was filled up with all sorts of uh, uh, space officials and uh, Soviet civil servants and so on, the front half and the big half, the, the upper half, why we were still kept outside, was filled up with crocodiles of nurses uh, and quotes workers being <laughs> marched in to take all the seats. And uh, they were quite deliberately torturing us and uh, I was quite worried the BBC having sent me there and paid for me, uh -huh. I began to think I was not going to get my story, you uh -huh. see. It was most unpleasant. Of course they made bookings to, for me to broadcast and so on. Finally, when the conference was just about to begin, mm -hmm. they let us in. Uh, there were quite a small group of us at the back there, of, um, uh, foreign space correspondents. I can't remember who they were now. So I was quite unable to uh, link up with a Viz News cameraman who was supposed to meet me. I never, never found him. Oh. Uh, and I went in and uh, the hall was packed and I looked around desperately for a seat and halfway along a row at the back of the conference hall uh -huh. uh, there was one seat uh, amid all these very large, heavily built nurses, mm -hmm. so-called nurses, I forced my way into the seat through their knees mm -hmm. and sat there. And then I had to get up again and uh, they, they said written questions only, so I had to write my questions, force my way out, go down to the front and drop the questions in a box. Right and then force my way back again with all these tittering nurses. It was really most unpleasant. So uh, the idea of having the nurses uh, and other people, was this a bit like a, a rental mob to fill yes. up the space? It is exactly what it was. Ah. It was a phony press conference from beginning to end. And, and it was, uh, in a way, the Soviets trying to assert their superiority in their success. Oh, the it was an entirely a choreographed occasion, uh, really, to uh, humiliate the West and uh, humiliate people like me as representatives of the West. Were there any American reporters there? Well, uh, there must have been, but as you see, we were all we were all mixed up. What happened to the other people who went in? I mean, we when we did go in, we were a small mob pushing our way in. Everybody was a sort of panic-stricken because they didn't know where to sit or what to do or anything. 
and I, I was on my own, very much on my own, when I found this seat. <clears throat> and there were um, presumably press from all over the world, not just uh, Europe and America. Well, presumably there were, yes, uh, but uh, I was not aware of them. You see, we were. I was aware of them when we were in a group outside, but once I, we were in the hall, everybody was spread out trying to find an odd seat, and uh, we were. There were no proper seats for the press at all as you go. <laughs> uh, you say that um, the uh, questions and answers session was pretty much superficial. Have you got an example, a few examples? Oh of yes, the indeed of I have. Um, it was all, <laughs> it was all terribly worrying because we had an hour and a half uh -huh. of, of uh, speeches in Russian by all the various officials, mm -hmm. uh, which were partly translated. There was a, a, a man named Boris, Belov Boris Belitsky, whom I got to know in later years quite well, an excellent translator, but he didn't, tra he didn't really translate much of the opening speeches, mm -hmm. so we didn't really know what was going on, except there were great preambles about um, the workers and so on, and uh, all these um, formulas they have for introducing it. And uh, I sat there for an hour and a half getting more and more fidgety and worried because I thought I was going to miss my uh, broadcasting slot, you course, see. Yeah. I had to go to Moscow Radio uh -huh. where the, I was booked in to do a broadcast mm -hmm. um, for radio and television news. <clears throat> so finally we got to the questions and there was this uh, bright young man, a very, uh, I mean very impressive, I was always uh, very impressed with um, Yuri Gagarin, a very smart young man. Uh -huh. In fact, he was picked of course, because although they'd, uh, they'd selected over 20 cosmonauts and trained, mm -hmm. he was obviously the brightest, most okay. self-assured, and yet he wasn't vain or arrogant. He was a rare human being. Um, <clears throat> he stood up and uh, started to answer our questions. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we got what journalists call the classic idiot treatment. Perhaps I can give you one or two examples. Mm. You see, when I asked him about him, uh, did, he, did, he, did he land inside the spacecraft or did he eject from it on the way down? This was very important to know. The Western scientists wanted to know because it gave us a clue to how sophisticated the spacecraft was. The first question to him which was used uh, was, um, did you land inside the Vostok spacecraft or eject and descend on a parachute, you see? Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, this is this, we desperately wanted to know the answer. Uh, and um, it was a very important answer for the Soviets um, because they wanted to claim this as a, an aeronautical, international aeronautical record. And to claim this as a record, uh, the pilot had to be in the spacecraft for launch and landing. Mm -hmm. So that was a secondary reason we wanted to know. And the answer he gave us to us, he was, he was pulled down by Academician Blagonrovov, who was sitting in the chair, and he whispered in his ear uh, before he answered. And um, then uh, Yuri uh, stood up straight and smiled and looked at the audience, and uh, the answer that we got was, Whichever it, way it was, you can see it was successful. There was a roar of laughter, and this set the tone for the whole conference. Um, and uh, I can give you some more examples. Uh, when were you told you were the first cosmonaut? I was told in good time. How many cosmonauts are there? Uh, I believe there are more than enough. Uh, to undertake important flights. When will the next space flight take place? I think our scientists and cosmonauts will undertake the next flight when it's necessary. And then, 
And so it went on, the whole way. everybody roaring in laughter. And when I described it was a, a good, an example of good humoured invasion, uh, evasion. Well, it was good humoured as far as the audience was concerned. Uh, they were all communists who thought it was all terribly clever. Mm -hmm. And then um, my question. Uh,